MLS Youth Development has drastically improved, but what has to be done so we can take that next step? What is the missing piece or missing pieces for the U.S. Men's National Team to develop that generational talent, a world-class player from a global standpoint? I don't know the answer to that. I have suggestions, but I do have a guest with some wonderful insight and great suggestions of how U.S. soccer can move forward in terms of youth development. Hi, I'm Ijan Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV. And welcome to a very special episode. Today we have an exclusive talk slash interview with Augusto Carizo. He took part as a player in the Argentine youth development when he was younger. And now he's highly involved with U.S. youth soccer as he is the father of Maximo Carizo, the 14-year-old Argentine-American that has already signed a pro contract with New York City FC and is one of the top prospects in U.S. soccer. And yes, he is wanted by the Argentine youth national teams and the U.S. as well, along with being eligible to playing for both. We will address that later in the interview with Augusto, along with his takes on youth development in the United States, Argentina, and how we can improve. So sit back, relax, smash the like button, and share this video with every single family member that you have, and that includes your dog. Okay. All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome here to Tactical Manager TV. Today we have a special guest, Augusto Carizo, and he's here to talk about youth development here in the United States from a father's perspective that's been living through it quite a bit. And I'm actually very curious to what he has to say because he has different, I have experience in that setup, but he has a different experience on it that I want to hear about. And Augusto, first, thank you for coming along and taking the time. Filippo, thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to share thoughts on mm -hmm. on the matter that everyone can ha everyone has an opinion yeah but i mean you're going to be sharing with us your experience and, and that's going to be something very important especially because you have a kid that's being very successful already moving up the ranks at such a young age so why don't we start with this and i was briefly chatting with you about this and you kind of mentioned it that i wanted to talk about mls academy development but then you said why don't we talk about prior to that how do kids get there here in the united states mm. so from your experience Obviously, Massimo, your son, he's already uh, in actually New York City's first team, right? He's professionally at age 14, but he did go through the academy. Why don't you tell me more of what you meant about that? Where do you want to go with it about what happens before in the U.S. and maybe give your perspective on it from an Argentine standpoint? Uh, yes, the, the, I mean, look, my, my, my view on, on, on youth development is also tainted by my, my um my my experience as a, as a former player myself in in Argentina. So um, I I uh, uh, but my kids are all born here and they 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 developed as players in this context. So I I also uh, added my 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 side of how to understand and love the game uh, and also my different approach on how to interact within the ecosystem that we have in the u.s of youth development um so the 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 youth development part in the u.s i, I think there is a it's always positive from where i see it but there are moments uh, in 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 uh in the u.s uh in this in the history of this sport in the u.s because for 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 argentina or or Brazil, um, this is part of the culture. I mean, there are a lot of things that we're taking as a given, as a given, which is you, 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 you're born there. You, there is no way you're not gonna love game. You're gonna have to, even if you don't like it, you're gonna have to play. You're gonna have to interact with it. All those things at a point in the U.S. they didn't exist. That culture didn't exist, so it needed to be created. And in order to create it, you need to create. A system where all this is going to happen. So you needed to structure, uh, and and that structure gave space for the development of the sport in the U.S. at a massive level in the U.S. in, in the in the youth uh, spheres. The good thing right now you already have American parents that were born playing the sport, but before that didn't happen, and for that to happen. You need to create the structure, structure that you have right now. My view is 
criticizing that part, you will find a million mistakes on, on that structure. But first, you needed the foundations that didn't exist and they got created. And now you have a culture and you have American kids born into the sport as a primary sport. And they play this sport as a first choice for the rest of their lives. That's a big accomplishment because now you have kids born, uh, being born into this sport compared to other American sports that are, have been there from, from much longer. But the, the problem is with that evolution, the current system, I don't think is the proper one at the early stages, grassroots level, to now start really uh, taking advantage of the talent and mm -hmm. being able to exploit the innate gifts that kids are born with. Because it's very structured and now you need, you need a, a system that gives you freedom to fall in love with the game. Uh, but this is to me a case that what, 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 what got you there is not going to take you to where, where you need to go. But we, the U.S. needed that structure. Evolution in the system, now we're, it's tricky because that structure also brought a system that became pay to play. Mm -hmm. And evolving a system where, uh, where now there are economic interests at a very young age, it's hard because you have to let go of, of, of those interests. And, and, and that's tricky. It is tricky. Yeah. And, 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 and the other very big part is how do you, how do you make it a lot more inclusive? Um, for those that can pay, which today you have a lot of informal structures for, for, for those that are out of the system that because they're not able, are able to afford um but they're not able to become part of those leagues where the most competitive level happens so they fall behind mm -hmm. so there is a task to be done probably for the mls clubs mainly to start giving more authority to those out of the system leagues uh, so they don't get uh, lost in the system so one question um so what you think right now this is what i got and i actually agree with that okay i have experience too coaching at the youth level it seems like the u.s has more of a problem on the very young ages rather than the older ages there's a good structure moving up but at the very young ages it's still pay to play maybe no pickup culture i'm sure you can relate to that with argentina brazil pickup culture is massive for creativity players having freedom yeah. it's a little bit too structured and so you say maybe mainly now the main issue is not mls section but like the pre-mls like when you get to the academy how does that kid come in is that what you're saying yes because look the the the, the issue is you you're having in the system probably in my view 90 percent of the players are getting to the MLS academy systems, they're great practice players. Mm -hmm. Amazing practice players because that's what they've been taught from the first moment that that uh, they started interacting with the sport. You need to do great in practice and you practice and your structure and you have to follow the structure and you need to do best working very hard, running the most and trying to execute the drill, the drills the best. But the the uh, the freedom, the creativity uh, that comes with, and the IQ development that comes with uh, reaching the next level is not part of the early stage. And the the truth is, all the parts that are work at the beginning of the grassroots level, those are the commodity parts. Anyone that puts enough time will be good at it. But the first moment that you get in love, in fall in love with the game, to me, the most important side is to develop the IQ and to develop the flexibility and the decision making, which is when the brain of the kids are most ready to absorb. So at that critical moment, basically what you're doing is you're structuring movements instead of being working on, on developing the, the intangibles that makes you decide different that makes you decide quicker, that makes you 
become more uh, creative or effective in how you decide or how you move around with the field that becomes a lot more natural. Because mm-hmm. the technical and the tactical side, anyone can develop that. The physical side, anyone can develop that. But there are, there are very specific moments to nurture a high IQ. Uh, and I think it's a little bit uh, uh, backwards. I think the approach is more the, the athletic and execution than the creative and, and soft side of, of the sport. Uh, so I think on, 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 uh, on that aspect, the, the, the creating spaces for free play gives you that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when you get into the more formal system, they work on the rest. Yeah, it's it's essentially what you're going towards. It's a, it's a bit of like what we have at basketball here in the U.S. because we have so many players playing pickup. And you see we have we developed the best basketball players mm-hmm. in the world, or at least most of them, right? I know there's some from Europe that are amazing. Yeah. And when you go to Argentina, Brazil, uh, you go. So I'm talking about those specifically, obviously, because you're from Argentina. I grew up in Brazil. You see kids just playing soccer anywhere and they're trying to copy Ronaldinho. They're trying to copy Messi and they're trying to copy this guy. And many of them are not going to be able to copy them, but some of them will. And they're going to perfection it and get better and get better. And there's one thing that I was talking once to Pareja here in Orlando. And he even asked me once, like, OK, you played soccer. He's like, yeah, I played it. Like, how did you learn how to turn and dribble? I was like, I don't know. I was just probably playing and I learned, right? There's certain parts of the game you can't teach. The kid has to just play and learn. And when you have something way too structured, sometimes you kind of like, how do I say it? Um, You kind of block that creativity from the kid, right? Becomes a very like robotic player, which is not what we see in South America per se. Yeah, I, 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 I grew up. We, I, I did, uh, I did um, academies in, in uh, where where I live. There are a couple of uh, first team uh, clubs. Uh, mm-hmm. But for me, uh, it, it's um, a professional. I made it far. I made it to reserves, and and then mm-hmm. I came to play college because, uh, uh, like like many of, of our cases, my dad didn't want me to play. Uh, mm-hmm. So you make it as far as as uh, you don't need your dad's approval, and then when you need it, that's yeah. it. <laughs> uh, for me, it was come to college and then do well. Uh, and I come from a big family, and it's a big soccer family. I have mm-hmm. where uh, eight siblings, six boys. My dad played, my grandpa's played, and and everyone is very very good. So it comes in the genes as well. Uh, but but here. Uh, but so I, I know I know the I know the path I I, I went through it uh, mm-hmm. myself. Um, but uh, then I, I moved into a, a, a secret corporate career, and 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 I to be honest, I ended up coming back into into uh, being more engaged with the sport when when Maximo decided that he wanted to um, to play uh, soccer. Which, by the way. Uh, it wasn't the first sport for him. He, I had him play other sports because I didn't want it to be a Monday because I played it. You're going to do it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, see, he, he was a, a Taekwondo medalist for many years. So he liked uh, kicking. He played rugby. Him. And then one day he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, there, there was a purpose. <laughs> to be honest, there was a purpose for him to do uh, Taekwondo because he, he makes a difference in the... Uh, in the development reflex uh, 360 control of your body awareness i mean before we move on to i want to talk a bit about mls academy now since we talked beforehand so let's do this let's go by two parts one i wanted to ask you in terms of maximo's development since you went through the argentine process i'm pretty sure that's what you bring to the table obviously that's where you learn so that's what you're going to bring and it's been proven to be successful for sure worldwide so I wanted to go in two parts here. I want one for, to talk about. So if you're you're a soccer dad here in the U.S., you're a father with a son that's going professionally. What would be your advice to any soccer parents of like how can they help their kid develop before they get to the MLS academy? What would be your advice of what to do, what what not to do, uh, from your perspective? The um, one thing that I did. That I think it was a cornerstone for, for not not just Maximo. I have 
four boys. So Maxim is the oldest. I have three more, and, and we did it. Is um, I replaced the uh, the free playing spaces that we don't have. Uh, I took them upon myself to create it for them. So I, I never really sat down and say, okay, now we're gonna practice. Now we're gonna work. No, no, I just play with them. I just play with them, but I did it on a consistent basis. And I did it pretty much every day, which is go and play, which is go and play. No pressure, no nothing. Just express yourself. And we walk the field and uh, I make you familiarize with a big field and walk around it and feel comfortable with it, feel comfortable in front of the goal. But I'm not teaching you anything. I'm not making you feel you are not in training or anything like that. Because for the parents that play the game, it's very easy to fall into that trap. And you, and, you, and I walk around everywhere and you see parents practicing with their kids. And it's like, they already go to practice and they still have to go to practice with, with the dad. And the truth is, the other problem is if your kid is gifted and, and you're not, then you're trying to develop your kid from your limitations and not to his potential. And if your kid, if your kid is gifted, you need to let, he's gonna, he's gonna, see, you just need to have him uh, put him on the field. You don't need to teach him anything. He's gonna come to it. So then you're limiting his potential to develop. And you need to understand that. Just because you're older and you played it doesn't mean that you will, you're able to uh, nurture the best out of him. Sometimes it's best to get out of the way so he can become better than you. So that's another big part. Um, and then all this happens at the early stages the most. Um, so I, I created that open space to play. Um, and, and while we do it, we'll just, we just reason through th some things. So he starts picking up concepts and then they take it to the next level. They push themselves into uh, testing or, or doing things with a little bit of the tools that you give them. And it gets a point when you add it enough days that it's just go on their own. So creating that safe playing space, even if you haven't played the sport, just get in front of him, do anything, but make it make him create the space where he's going to feel fall in love with the game and he's gonna open up. Mm -hmm. that, that's the one thing that I did on a regular basis. I had the advantage of being adding certain concepts to it and probably help him develop certain basic skills that will allow him quickly to start exploring even more. But as a, as a parent, I created that safe space where he can open up and create. Um, and then, to be honest, you, you really, I mean, everyone says it, but it's, it's hard to practice, to, to apply this. Everyone needs to get out of the way. Uh, coaches, you might like it how they coach or not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you have to get out of the way. That's what they do. That's what they do for a living. They know more than you. Uh, I can say I know enough, but I, I know enough that I don't know how to coach. I can't coach a team. I know I, uh, that it's not my strong suit. So you need to get out of the way because at the end of the day, the kid is going to make it through into whatever next level is if if he has that talent, nobody's going to take it away from me. You can say no because this coach didn't give me this opportunity or not. At the end of the day, if you're good enough, you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a phrase that, that the city, the, the, the Manchester City is called, the city people use very often. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, talent always rises to the top. And, and it's true. Uh, so you really need to get out of the way. 100% sure parents always have a biased opinion on what's happening. And yeah. some days you might be right, but when you look at the long t and, 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 the, and the bigger uh, sp uh, spectrum, nobody's here to to uh, 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 to do anything bad to your kid. Nobody wins from that. Everyone wants the best for the kids. Everyone, every time you go into uh, into a structure system, in uh, the coaches, they, they they don't want they they don't want they, they want your kid to do well. And you might or might not like the approach of the coach. That's a different thing. But you need to let them do their job. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm board director 
on the uh, on on the on the on the club uh, here where, where we live, and and I, I, I until recently I was the, the president for for the soccer program, um, and I I I, I uh, I'm very protective of our grassroots uh, structure, which is is very good. We create that safe space, and there are kids that the first time they step into a field, four or five year olds. And the parents bring all their expectations into a kid. Parents that never kicked the soccer ball bring all these expectations mm -hmm. into the kid that is for the first time kicking the ball. And you're saying, oh, that's it. You, lo you lost one kid already. Before he even started, you lost one kid. Because now that kid that is managing to grasp the basic of the sport is getting pressure from a kid, from, from his parent, which is mm -hmm. the biggest authority voice he has in his life that guy outside is yelling at him he's putting pressure on him when he's trying to figure out how to how to basically move into a sport that he doesn't know so uh, everyone says uh, the same thing because it's true which makes it uh, a problem uh which pretty much what happens right there is the, the problem is everywhere yeah, the passion, the the passion the kid has for the sport will go away because it becomes just a pressure, like like homework almost, right? You don't want to do it uh, because your parent is pressuring you and pressuring you. But Augusto, going on here, picking up from where you left off there, let's go into the New York City Academy, mm. New York City FC Academy, because I think there yeah. the, the the problem with MLS specifically is when people refer to MLS, they talk about MLS as if MLS is a club, right? If you go to South America, you're going to talk about the Boca Academy, the River Academy, the Flamengo Academy. They're separate yeah. things. They're not a league. But MLS, they seem to say MLS, yeah. which is not true. There's academies doing a good job. There's academies doing a horrible job. I could yeah. start listing them here, but I'm not going to get yeah. into that. I want to talk about the one you specifically know. Personally, it's not because you're yeah. here. I think New York City FC has done a good job uh, from player development. I don't live it, so you might have a different perspective. You see James Sands that came out of it. That's a good player. Joe Scali as a young player mm -hmm. making it in the Bundesliga. Gio Reyna, for anyone who doesn't know, came out of that academy. Um, and there are players coming up too, like including your son right now. So can you talk a little bit about their academy? Do you agree that they're very good? Uh, I mean, you're, you're, your son's obviously there right now. And what do you think they're doing right at the moment? Um, look, I think there is the, the first, the first uh, step in terms of uh, MLS academies, is you need to know which one is the right fit for for your son, because uh, amongst all those that are good, they're all different, and they all have a different development approach, and they all have different goals and objectives throughout the academy process. Some academies will tend to try to uh, prioritize uh, results. Uh, and what are the players that will give them the most results throughout the different pathways? And some academies will concentrate more on the individual development of the players, even if they if they have to sacrifice uh, winning the league. And some academies are more patient with with, with players, um, and they concentrate on the individual development. And some others create a context of a high pressure and survival of the fittest and uh and that's good too and that's a system that also works um but but i think those systems also um are not positive for those that are probably uh, late boomers uh, so many players don't really make it into their top potential because at the moment in which the academy was concentrating on on the right now, they, they weren't there yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, from from the perspective of NYCFC, what I what I always liked is uh, because it's part of City Football Group is uh, um, it comes uh, the style and the approach to development uh, is more influenced by the vision of. It's a hundred percent influenced by the vision of the city full group and the, how they how they play, and I always thought that context is is um, is ideal for the way the Maximo plays. Uh, so um, 
But again, uh, Philly or Red Bulls, uh, um, the guys at Cincinnati, they do a very good job uh, also. Mm -hmm. But they're different. And I don't think Maximo would, would fit. Uh, he, he would fit, but I don't think he will reach his uh, maximum potential in those contexts because they just have a different approach. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, but they all do they all do very good a very good job, and they are great competitors. Um, so uh, I think City is very good at at the individual development of a player. They look at the technical and and uh, the technical capabilities, the the work ethics, and they bet on the player a little bit more long term uh, mm -hmm. than uh, than than all the other academies that I that I've known. And you, you have, we have so many great examples where that patience has paid off so good for, for NYCFC. Um, but that doesn't mean that they leave competitiveness aside. Uh, uh, playing academy in any MLS academy is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. Um, you need to be able to uh, endure the, the pressure and the intensity and there is always somebody else wanting your spot. Uh, so it's 110%. Playing 100% is not enough. It's 110. It's 110 every day. Okay. Uh, so um, that, that part is not for everyone. But I, what I do like about mm, my kids' academy was that um, uh, they they're not afraid to risk on the development of the individual player, and uh, you can you can tell by the decisions that they made with Maximo. Nobody, I mean, it's very hard on the right mind to give a professional contract to a young player, and uh, he yeah. plays. Uh, he's been two years that he hasn't played in academy. Uh, he plays in the second team, and he spends most of his time with the first team. And he plays well in the preseason. He played pretty much every single game. He started most of them. Yeah, so the club, it's uh, they're they're willing to take the risks, and they're willing to um, to be uh, a, to be very um, uh, innovative in how to say, okay, what we need, we need to. Uh, I think we can reach the sky. What we need to make it happen. Um, so, um, and there will be mistakes along the way. And it's fine because the truth is we're, we're into uncharted territory. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but the club is willing to do it. And, and, and it's not just because it's, it's maximal. They, they, they are willing to do it with any kid. Well, that has and also the potential. Also, I don't, each player is different too. Right, each player they're treating, uh, it's going to be a different situation, different talent, different style of play, different ability. Right, some players, but going on from catching on from that, from the MLS Academy, what, um, because I want to go and talk a little bit about you talked about that. I want to talk about U.S. youth national team and Argentina youth national team real quick before we finish this up. But what would you be more critical nowadays of the well the, the problem is i don't want to talk about mls because your experience with new york city fc is there anything in the academy system in mls that you think could improve i'll put it that way instead of critical but you say mm, this is not how i would do it look it's it's um again it's always easy to uh, to criticize from outside um i think the the academy system it's it's amazing it's amazing the how much good he has done in the us uh, well, you know, Maximo, he he played, he spent time playing in, in Dortmund, one, two years up. Uh, he spent time in Europe, in uh, in City. In, I mean, he, he, knows, he knows the level of the top competition in Europe. And the U.S., the U.S. is not behind. Now, at a point, it's it's lagging the the last brush of the development of a player to turn it into a more elite level, but I think with MLS Next Pro and a few more things, 
we're gonna we, we're gonna build that missing piece but the, the academy system jumped uh, jumped the quality of the development so much look you, you you're looking at today there are the players that are coming out of the academy system into the MLS next teams compared to the players that are coming from college into the MLS next teams you can tell how much how big is the difference in the technical quality of the players from the academy from the ones coming from college that didn't at this point, those players come from college. They didn't go through a full academy development cycle. Mm -hmm. But you can tell the academy players, the quality is, is so much uh, better that, that it only gets, 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 gets great. Now, uh, what I think, if I, if I have to say uh, a point that needs to get better is I, I don't think the, the system is ready yet to be able to identify and exploit the the gifted talents, the creative players, mm -hmm. uh, those different ones. I, I don't think they, they they don't the system doesn't have that experience, and then and then that's why I praise NYCFC a bit more because it's a club that is so influenced and 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 is so uh, engaged with City Football Group that they have those capabilities built in to identify players that are different and do what it, because they, they the group has that experience. Um. So, but the, the rest of the MLS clubs, they don't have those years of experience that a city football group has and nurtures, you know, the different clubs. So the system, I don't think is, is, is ready yet to take on those different players and, and understand how do you nurture and develop them. Because the reality is those players, you, you need to approach them differently. Mm -hmm. Um. I think that's the one missing part, which I think this conversation started with that uh, interview to, um, what was his name? The, um, uh, the, the, the general, no, not the general manager, the technical director from, from the, uh, from the uh, U.S. soccer. Uh, Bernie Stewart? Yeah, he was saying that the U.S. was missing the creative. Yeah, Bernie Stewart. Yeah. Uh, this whole conversation started with that article. And and he's right. He's right on the point. The US mm -hmm. is missing that that type of player, and the system is not producing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 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 Maximus case is a different case because he has me because he has a city football group. Uh, but it's a different. It's a different reality. It's not the normal. So I think the system is missing that part, and and he's right on that. Yeah, I think personally, what when I see US soccer, right, I follow a lot of the South America and CONCACAF. Those are the two I mainly, obviously, everyone watches Europe, right? But CONCACAF and Combo I watch the most. And in Brazil, at least, we say that the players have some gingado. They play like a dance, right? There's creativity, dribbling, flair. The American players, you see that they tactically, they understand the game. They know how to have a good first touch nowadays they know how to pass they know how to do set they know how to do everything that the players in south america can do but it just seems like when push comes to shove there's that little spice missing in the american player right that ability in tight spaces a little bit of a showman right something that you see Lionel messi do there but but the thing is it's not just messi vinicius neymar it's not just those guys you get players from south america that are even at a lower level you see the flair Right, you see that it's there, the creativity. They might yeah. even be worse than the American mm -hmm. player, but they have that little extra. We need to have that in the US. That's something we're missing. I think you already talked about this early in the video. You talked about pickup culture. We need that. We don't have it. And and MLS clubs and USL clubs have to enable that, find a way to get more kids to play pickup, more futsal. I think futsal is wonderful for tight spaces, for creativity, because mm -hmm. the kids get more touches than in a big field. So again, it, it was Ernie Stewart. You're right. Ernie Stewart talked about but it needs that. Needs to be done at the right moment. Yes, but it needs to be done at the right at the right moment. At the moment in which the kids are ready to absorb that, because mm -hmm. the more you grow and the more you're structured, the harder it's going to be to to change mm -hmm. in, in, into that. So all that needs to happen in the early stages. And Augusto, to close things, and up we'll here, go back to that initial point. Because I know you have to go out very yeah. soon. So I want to close things up with one thing here. 
United States and Argentina. I know you don't speak on behalf of Maximo, neither do I. He can play. For, he's eligible to play for both from the U.S. because he was born in New York and uh, for Argentina because yep. of his heritage, parents. So completely outside of that, mm. um, Argentina youth setup, U.S. youth setup. Have they been both in touch with Maximo? And what is your perspective of it? Not in regards to who he will choose or who he should choose. What is your perspective of what do each one do differently? Not in development because national teams don't develop players. They just call them in, integrate them. What do no. you see different between those two? Um, I think it, uh, obviously they, they have probably different challenges. The U.S. being so massive is a reality. It makes it a lot harder to uh, identify all the players. But, well, you don't need to identify Maximo at this point anymore. Uh, I, I'll tell you a difference that I noticed from the get-go is uh, the, 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 I have a much closer follow-up from, from Argentina than from the U.S., for example. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in touch with the U.S. once in a while. Um, but I have a, a, a much closer follow-up from the from 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 Argentina, and it's not. I, to be honest, I didn't know them. They found us, uh, and they do their homework a different way than what the US does. Um, but on the on the day to day, they have a much closer follow-up, and I know, and not always, is good sometimes. They say things that you probably don't agree with them, but they're always there. You know, they're always there. They, they always uh, follow up closely where uh, the player is at. They uh, give you their two cents on uh, how they see uh, the player for the upcoming opportunities. Uh, sometimes it might come in your favor, sometimes it might not. But you know where you're standing always, and you know how they're approaching things, and then they know the reasons why yes and the reasons why no. Uh, so it, it gives, uh, you, you pr I probably have a, a lot more visibility. Uh, but again, it's always, there's you have very little influence on, on their decisions that they make. Uh, with the US, I, 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 uh, I, I don't have a lot of interaction with them. I didn't, I don't seek it. If they want to have it, we'll have it. If not, they, if, I mean, they, uh, I, I, I had a meeting once um, with them and and because uh, um, th there is always, Maximo has such a different reality that if he gets called into a camp, but he's training with the first team or he's going to be playing first team games in preseason, for example, uh, in terms of his development, Sometimes that's better than going to a camp. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so it, it's and, and he's me trying to explain, and it's not that I'm choosing one over the other or anything like that. But but right now the most important thing is, is development for Maximo, and and he doesn't play academy. So every minute, and he needs to fight for every single minute to get on on the field. There, there is no, they don't make any difference with him. He's hold to exactly the same standards that any other player. So he needs to fight for every single minute. If he needs to fight for every single training. Because he could be training with the second team or the first team. And to be training with the first team, you need to be called by the first team. And every single week, you need to work hard so you keep staying in the first team training. Or if you're in the, with the second team, you need to justify why you should be playing that weekend. So that's uh, those are the, the two main differences that I have between the relationship with one or the other. Right now, the only the most important thing for uh, for Maximo is development. Where is he going to have the best development opportunity? Then it's going to be his, his choice. It will always be his choice, and there are advantages to both sides. There are great advantages to both sides. Um, yep. But right now, the only thing that really matters is it's is, is, uh, is development opportunities and nothing else. Uh, 
there is no patriotic cause. I'm a, I'm not gonna. I'm from Argentina. If I, if you ask me, I'll say, yeah, I wanted to play for Argentina. But That's my time from. is over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> my my time yeah, is over. It's not my decision. <laughs> I mean, if, if you ask um, my dad, it'd be the same thing. He grew up in Brazil. Uh, li- well, I mean, my dad lived in Brazil for 50 years of his life, right? So where would you play that? He loves the US, but if you go, dad, where would you play? Brazil, okay. Amarelinha, always. Uh, I'm, oh. it's, a, it's a tough one, obviously. I can't really put myself on the shoes of Maxwell because I don't have a chance to play in either one. But it is, I'll, I'll, I'll close it on this. It kind of sucks for the US that we had 14-year-old Maximo see his national team win a World Cup. Uh, one of them, right? Argentina. It also sucks for me because you guys got some catching up to do there, though, right? You got three. We got five here in Brazil. We'll catch up one day. <laughs> <laughs> one day. But I bet you guys wish to be asked right now. <laughs> we'll get you in 2026. But Augusto. Thank you very much for coming along. This was fun. Look, we might I tell you one, one, one last thing. I hate Brazil more than anything else when we play. But if it's not us, I'd rather be you guys. Yeah, I mean... And it's a love-hate I'll, relationship. I'll put it this way. I think one day we need to come here to the channel and talk a little bit about the Brazil-Argentina rivalry because I tell Americans all the time, it is very different from the Mexico-US rivalry. It is not the same. It is very much different. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's weird. It's almost like we hate each other and we envy each other. There's aspects of Brazil that I know Argentines want to have. And there's aspects of Argentina that Brazilians want to have. We wanted to have Messi. We don't have Messi. We wanted to have Messi. Uh, but, but anyhow, Augusto, thank you very much for coming along. This was lots of fun. We hope to have you back soon and we're wishing Maximo the best of luck. And we'll be following him along the next few seasons in major league soccer. And hopefully he chooses the U S Oh, I pointed it wrong. The U S Thanks for watching, everyone. Drop a like. Have a great day.